Good afternoon, everyone. Before I um, say anything, I want to introduce some people because I always feel it is apropos uh, for people to understand and know those who are part of uh, the King family. And so I am honored today to have members of my family that have descended from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., Daddy King, who was my father's father, and Alberta Williams King, who was my father's mother. Um, I first want to uh, recognize Derek Barber King Sr., who is the son of Alpha Daniel King. Alpha Daniel King uh, unfortunately left this earth one year and a few months after my father in a mysterious circumstance. He was found in his pool, did not drown, did not have water in his lungs. The mystery is still trying to be unraveled. But he is the oldest, the, not the oldest, because Al was the oldest. He is the son of A.D. King. His mother, who is the widow of A.D. King, Mrs. Naomi Barber King, is here with us today at 91 years of age. And we thank God for her. My aunt, Dr. Christine King Ferris, very much wanted to be here today. She is 95 on her way to 96 years of age. Uh, she is the only living member of my father's birth family, and we thank God that she is still with us along with Aunt Naomi. Uh, Dr. Christine King Ferris's daughter, um, Angela, Dr. Angela Ferris Watkins is with us, a professor at Spelman College. Um, and her daughter, the granddaughter of Dr. Christine King Ferris, Ferris Watkins is here with us today. Um, Angela's brother, um, Isaac Ferris Sr., who is the oldest of Dr. Christine King Ferris and uh, Uncle Isaac, Isaac Newton Ferris, he's here with us today. And then we have one of our cousins, and I don't like saying this, and I know this is not a good word, widow, uh, Laurel Hill, our cousin Tucson Hill, King, K Tucson King Hill, um, Junior passed um, suddenly, I won't say suddenly, but to me it was suddenly, uh, just a few years ago. She is here with us today, so I want to thank all of them for being with us today. I also want to say we're in good hands. It seems a little uh, turbulent and troubling right now, uh, but I thank God for these young voices that were lifted today. Um, thank you so much, Micah, and all of you young people who shared your heart and your vision and hope for the world, and I know that you are going to align your life with what you spoke. Um, <clears throat> 55 uh, years ago, and I won't be but a second because this is a very difficult time for me as I get older, I get a little more emotional about um, today. Um, and if I might be very frank with everyone here today, I shared with some of my team that I'm empty. Yep. I've been doing a lot of speaking for the last uh, 42 um, years of my life. I know that seems that I'm, you know, young, but I just turned 67 uh, days ago. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to say just a, a, a little bit um, because I need to. Uh, 55 years ago today, around 6.05 p.m. Central Time, 7.05 p.m. Atlanta Time, um, my father's life was cut short by an assassin's bullet. He didn't die. What do I mean by that? Many people, when they talk about that day, say Martin Luther King Jr. died. No, his life was cut short by an assassin's bullet that caused a cessation of his breath on this earth. But he didn't die. He transitioned to a higher realm, 
And the reason I think this world has not come apart is because the spirit of Dr. King has been dispersed and dispensed throughout this universe, just as the spirit of the one that we call in the Christian faith, Jesus the Christ, is dispensed throughout this world. But Jesus is the person that Dr. King was following and in alignment with. And everything that he poured out was to connect us back to Jesus and the mission of Jesus, which was to love in a way that no matter how difficult, challenging, ugly, fierce, uh, mean, uh, oppressive, exploitative people might be, we have the capacity in our love to transform people's minds and their lives and our circumstance. And so Dr. King may not physically be with us here today, but he still lives. He lives in and through this family. He lives in and through this institution and those who work uh, with me here. He lives in and through many of you and those young people that are here today. But yes, we are in very turbulent and troubling times. And so although an assassin's bullet took his life, Today, I want to first stand in solidarity with the King Center, with those young people who have dared to leave school, walk out of school, and say we demand common sense, gun responsibility, and the banning of assault weapons. Now is the time to fulfill that particular legislation. And I want to encourage those who are doing that. Do as they did in Montgomery, Alabama. Don't let it just be one day and walk out. I dare you at some point to stay out of school until change comes. Because when young people stay out of school, regardless of the consequence, because they pay consequences in Montgomery, Alabama. Some lost jobs, some's homes were risked, some lost lives, but they dared to sacrifice so that the change would come. And if we're going to change the state of this nation and in this world, we are in a season that requires that kind of sacrifice once again. So I'm challenging those of us who continue to stand for, up for things that are unjust in our society. We've got to be willing to make the extraordinary sacrifice. For as a young person reminded us, if we haven't found something worth dying for, that means if we haven't found something worth sacrificing, if that means if we haven't found, found something worth giving up, if we haven't found something worth risking, then why are we fit to really live? Dr. King sacrificed his very life. And so as I, as, I, as I come to a close, as we remember this day, I want us to remember that Dr. King was a warrior of nonviolence and peace. And so I want to share these words with you in closing because I think they're so apropos and worth repeating. I spoke them on the west side of town. Now I speak them on the east side of town. My father was a warrior for peace. But we must understand for him, peace was not merely, true peace was not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. He reminded us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This means that injustice anywhere is a threat to peace everywhere. Therefore, the work of peace that he was endeavored, that he endeavored upon is inextricably bound to the work of justice. You can't carry forth the legacy of Dr. King and not stand for justice, not work for justice, not prioritize justice. That's why we often hear the chants coming out of the streets, no justice, no peace. If we want to see peace in our world, in our nation, in our state, in this city, 
in, in the streets and even in the streets, then we will have to commit to that work of justice, which means being inclusionary in every decision making. We are called upon to move beyond merely uh, having aspirations about justice or recitations about peace from the streets to the streets. Because as my father said, it does not take the sharpest eyed sophistication to discern that while everybody is talking about peace, peace, peace has been practically, and I would say, Justice has practically become nobody's business among the power wielders. Many of them cry peace, peace, but they refuse to do the things that make for peace. That's what Dr. King said. And so justice makes for true peace. Justice should become and must become front and center. Uh, Congresswoman, for, for, in all that we do for peace to become a reality, in the Kenyan spirit, that means in the spirit of Dr. King, justice must be our first priority as we do business and set policy in our Congress and in our corporate sector and in our state houses and in our city councils and in our city halls and in our judicial chambers and in our courtrooms and in our correctional institutions, in our classrooms, in our transportation sectors, in our health care arenas, in our law enforcement agencies, in our banking and lending institutions institutions, in our chambers of commerce and boards of trade, in our real estate industry. Indeed, justice must become a reality in every area of human, human life, even in our families and our relationships. For daddy, justice means love. He said justice at its best is love, correcting everything that stands against love. And so as we as a family began to prepare to lay this wreath. I want to remind you that Dr. King said on that last night in Memphis, Tennessee, don't stop here in Memphis. Maintain unity. He was in, in effect telling us, continue the movement. And so I want to remind you that we must be a movement for peace with justice, where everyone is treated with dignity and accorded respect. We must be a movement for peace with justice, where no one has to fear for their safety nor environmental devastation. We must be a movement for peace with justice, where no one lacks a livable wage, affordable housing, and access to affordable health care. We, collectively, each and every one of us, if you hear under the knee, under hearing my voice, all of us must be a movement for peace with justice, where everyone has the freedom to prosper, the freedom to participate and have their voice not just heard, but be included as a part of how we govern, and the freedom to peacefully coexist where we don't have to worry about little children and elderly people or any person being uh, dying as a result of gun violence. For as my father said, we still have a choice today. Still have a choice today. It's a choice that each and every one of us have to make. And that is nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. My encouragement to each and every one of us is to choose nonviolence so that we can create the beloved community where injustice ceases and love prevails. If you want to know more about nonviolence, I invite you to log on to thekingcenter.org. Take our self-paced, self-learning, nonviolence 365 e-learning experience. Because we will not get to a more just, humane, equitable, and peaceful world unless we begin to employ the nonviolence that Dr. King embodied and taught. Because he taught it, not just as a tactic to be used in the social justice movement, he taught it as a way of life. It's time for us to live 
nonviolence.